Today, as we mentioned, is Transfiguration Sunday. The pyramids are white. Uh, we've, it's the kind of the break between um, what we call ordinary time and the beginning of the season of Lent as we prepare for Easter. And on Transfiguration Sunday, we read the story from the New Testament of the Transfiguration of Jesus. Now, the Transfiguration is one of those events that's recorded in the Bible, but that we don't really think about too much. Peter, James, and John accompany Jesus to the top of a mountain where they encounter two great figures from Israel's past. They hear God's voice, and they see Jesus revealed as the Son of God. And in the life of the church, Transfiguration Sunday sets the stage for Ash Wednesday and the season of Lent that follows. So we read this story every, uh, every year on this Sunday, but most people probably aren't familiar enough with it to understand why it's particularly significant. Now, the Transfiguration would have been a remarkable experience for anybody to witness, frankly, but especially for Peter, James, and John. Born and raised within the Hebrew tradition, they would have been familiar with the stories of Moses and Elijah. The presence of the prophet Elijah would have brought to mind the belief among Jews that Elijah would return just before the Messiah came. And then the voice of God proclaiming Jesus as God's son might have led them to believe that this was about to happen right there in their presence. They would have remembered Moses going up Mount Sinai to receive the commandments from God. The whole event would have called to mind the words of Exodus 34 that we read today, that the Lord descended on, in the cloud and stood with Moses there. They would have remembered that after Moses came down with the Ten Commandments that the skin of his face shone because he'd been talking with God. And they would have remembered that Moses stayed up on that mountain with God for 40 days and 40 nights which might have been why Peter wants to stay there a while too. He asks to build dwellings for Moses and Jesus and Elijah in the hope of, of extending that experience. Moses stayed on Mount Sinai with God for 40 days. Maybe they could do the same thing. It was a powerful experience, and Peter wanted it to last as long as possible. Have you ever had an experience like that? One so spiritually powerful or, or joyful or life-affirming that you just never, ever wanted it to come to an end? Going to church camp was like that for me when I was a kid. <clears throat> Everyone was accepting. Jesus' love was celebrated, and we learned about God and heard the familiar stories of the Bible in new and exciting ways. We worshiped together and played together, and, and, and there was a certain amount of independence being away from home. But when the week was over, it was always hard to go home again, and and face the routines of everyday life. I think the beach is kind of like that for me now, to be able to stand beside the ocean, to, to hear the waves, to experience the power and the might of the sea, it reminds me of God. And in the sounds of the ocean, I hear the voice of God. So I can completely, totally understand what Peter's going for here. Who wouldn't want to stay and remain in the presence of God? But Jesus won't let them. He declines the offer to build booths to stick around for a while. And the disciples, well, he takes them back down the mountain to the valley where they're supposed to be. And these are two very different places, the mountaintop and the valley. As the mountaintop was shrouded in a heavenly cloud, the valley is filled with the mundane sights and sounds and smells of everyday life. As the mountaintop featured the angelic appearances of Moses and Elijah, well, the valley is filled with the masses of everyday people going about their everyday business. As the mountaintop rings with the voice of God, the valley resonates with the sounds of work and daily life. Though they long to stay in the presence of the holy mystery on the mountaintop, Jesus calls them down into the banality of life that is the valley. And when they arrive there, they are immediately encountered by the reality of that existence, when a man comes to them asking for help. Now that man is a father, and Luke tells us that he is desperate because his son is tormented by a spirit who seizes him and convulses him until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. Now even though the scripture writer identifies this as a spirit or a demon, 
most modern scholars recognize that these are the symptoms of an epileptic seizure. Why would Jesus call it a demon if it weren't? Well, William Barclay writes that Jesus was not a scientist, nor did he come to teach science. Maybe Jesus knew that he was healing a disease and just wanted to speak in the terms that people there would understand, or maybe he didn't know. But either way, Jesus heals this man's son and makes him well. As a father, whose sons have both struggled with seizures, I can tell you that I've never felt so helpless as when I have sat and held my child, waiting for a seizure to pass, praying. So I thank God every day for medicines and for doctors and for researchers who strive to understand and unlock the mysteries of the human bodies and with God's help do. So when Luke tells us that this father was desperate, I think I understand. And anyone who's ever been a parent or who has loved a child understands. Jesus reaches out and makes this child well. And we see there demonstrated in the valley the truth of the words that we heard on the mountaintop, that this man is the Son of God. You see, the mountaintop is a place apart from the routine of daily living. On the mountain, we see God revealed. We learn who Jesus is, and we see him in all of his glory. The mountaintop is a good place for us to step away from time to time. It's good to rest in God's presence. We might do that by taking a vacation or by going on a church retreat. Maybe that stepping away happens every week here at church. We're in worship and prayer and study and fellowship. We, we listen for God's voice where we experience something holy, something of the power and the presence of God. This place where you're sitting right now, is meant to be a place removed from the world. Church architecture is often intended to draw the eye and the mind to consider God. A lot of churches, like this one, have stained glass. And the stained glass serves two main purposes. One, the pictures in the glass tell the story of God. But two, they also prevent worshipers from staring out the windows in, in contemplation of something that isn't God. <laughs> Churches have high ceilings and soaring buttresses and great archways to remind worshipers of God's majesty. And a lot of churches have steeples that draw the eye upward to consider heavenly things. This place in which you are now sitting is called a sanctuary because it is a safe place removed from the world in which to find God. But you will notice, if you look carefully, that there are no bedrooms here. We have bathrooms, but no showers. And that's because, like the mountaintop, this is a place to visit, not to stay. You see, when the day is done, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. These moments of retreat from the world to reconnect with God whether in a place far away or in this very building, are important. But they supplement our lives of discipleship. They don't replace them. Now, as Mary mentioned a little while ago, today is not just Transfiguration Sunday. It is also Super Bowl Sunday. That's not an actual holiday in the church or otherwise, but it might as well be. Millions of people will watch the football game on TV all over the world. They'll eat and drink and cheer and enjoy themselves. And on the field, the players and coaches will be involved in one of the biggest events of their lives. Everything will be like an ordinary game, but it will also be different. Because it's not just a game, it's the Super Bowl. Every touchdown will become a Super Bowl touchdown. Every record will be a Super Bowl record. Every interception will be a Super Bowl interception. Even the commercials that most of us work so hard to avoid will become Super Bowl commercials. And millions of people will put off visiting the bathroom just to watch them. And when the game is over, the team that wins will not just be winners. They'll be Super Bowl champions. Playing in a Super Bowl is a huge deal. Only about 6% of professional football players ever get the opportunity. 
Russell Wilson is one of those. He knows what it's like to play in a Super Bowl. As quarterback of the Seattle Seahawks, he's done it for the last two years in a row. He's a superstar and a member member of an elite fraternity of Super Bowl winners. And twice in the last two years, he has stood at the pinnacle of his profession, a rare place where only a few people ever get to go. On top of that, he makes millions of dollars every year in salary and endorsement deals. He's dating a pop star. He lives in a mansion. Hard work and good fortune have brought Russell Wilson to a place where he can choose to withdraw from the world into a pampered existence of luxury and ease if he wants to. But here's something you may not know about Russell Wilson. You know what he did after last year's Super Bowl game? Well, on Tuesday of that week, just two days removed from one of the biggest events of his life, he was down at Seattle Children's Hospital visiting with sick kids and their families and with the doctors and nurses and staff that work there, just like most Tuesdays. You see, ever since he moved to Seattle in 2012, Russell Wilson has spent almost every Tuesday at the Seattle Children's Hospital visiting with those kids and their families. When he first came, the hospital staff thought it was nice, but they didn't expect him to make a habit of it. They get lots of celebrities there, maybe once or twice, but they they don't come back. But he did. And almost every Tuesday since he's been there, talking to kids, bringing them Seahawks stuff, and praying with them. Because Russell Wilson is a man of faith. Something he wants to do to help. And kids get excited when they see a big star like Russell Wilson show up. It gives them something to look forward to. It gives them a little lift in a hard situation. You could say that twice in his career, Russell Wilson's been to the mountaintop. But he knows that his life is meant to be lived in the valley. In the story that we read today, Jesus takes the disciples to a safe, comfortable place where they are fed and nurtured, like Grandma's house or Disney World. But he doesn't let them stay there. Their call and purpose is not to rest in the comfortable places, but to to live in the challenging places. You see, in the valley, there is struggle and there is pain, but there is also joy and, and community, and there are moments of grace. In the valley, there is risk and reward. In the valley, there is real life not an escape from it. Sometimes we need to go to the mountaintop to recharge, to listen for God's voice, to to be inspired. But the life of the disciple is not meant to be lived there. It's spent down in the valley, working with, walking beside, being in community with all of God's children, The call to discipleship isn't an escape from the world. It's an invitation to be in the world. Now, this week begins the season of Lent. And that's a time when we'll worship and pray and prepare ourselves for the events of Good Friday and Easter Sunday. You see, as Christians, we are very much Easter Sunday people. Jewish tradition places the Sabbath on the last day of the week, on Saturday. But Christians, Christians moved it to Sunday because Sunday is the day when Jesus emerged from the tomb. Every Sunday is a a mini Easter. But Lent is a season that pushes us to think not about resurrection, but about the human condition that made crucifixion possible and resurrection necessary. On Palm Sunday, in a few weeks, we'll shout Hosanna to the King of Kings. On Easter Sunday, we'll celebrate that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. But we don't get to rush to that glorious end just yet. We have to spend a good long time confronting what it means to follow this Jesus that we celebrate. This Transfiguration Sunday is intended to remind us that being a follower of this King who is the Son of God does not mean escaping from the world into a place of privilege. Following Jesus will mean being in the world, being in relationship with all God's children, serving them sometimes, and loving them always. 
So to God be all glory, honor, power, and dominion in this world and in the world that is to come.